Uh, what I want to say now are three things, three types of things. One is about zero in the role of the principal in relation to teacher leadership, that's one. Uh, second is to talk about uh, leadership from the middle that we uh, have latched on to. And the third is to uh, visit that deep learning question about the 10 ways to die with deep learning or the 10 ways to get to deep learning heaven. So those are the three things. So if we take, uh, and some of, one of you just mentioned how valuable the principal's book, uh, I did a, principal, a book in 2014, The Role of the Principal, Three Keys to Maximizing Impact. And in it, uh, I actually backed into the book for a negative reason. And the reason was this, uh, the phenomenon was this, that about, I guess about seven years ago, s coming to the surface was this notion the principal is instructional leader. So everybody was talking about it. And then I looked at what was happening with that uh, so-called research finding. The research finding said the principal is the second most important person in the school for impacting student learning. The first most is the teacher. Uh, and then what happened uh, w when this identification was the following. Uh, some states, and I won't name them, but several, uh, started to said, okay, we like this. We'll define the role of the principal as instructional leader. So the job description was like that. Second, they said, we'll change the criteria for promotion. Only those who are instructional leaders should be promoted to the position. Third, we'll change the behavior of principals. They should go into classrooms more and observe and give feedback and instructional rounds, whatever. And fourth, we'll have uh, people at the district level who will uh, go around making sure that they do play these roles, uh, supervisory roles. So I called it micromanagement madness. Said this can never work, not enough hours in the day. That's not the most important problem. Most important one is that the good, teach, good principles that I knew faked it. They knew it was wrong, so they didn't do it. They did something differently. So it got off to a bad start, and I said, well, what, what did the research say? What is the meaning of it? Because we had a sense of the meaning, and I won't go through all of this in the book, I identify these three things, but the one that was most powerful to start with was lead learner. And it wasn't just a slogan, it was an actual really clear description. And I, I don't have time to show you video clips of what it looked like, but I can tell you uh, descriptively uh, what it is and what it isn't. So, lead learner, if we take this, and you, you have this, the PDF I sent in, it's on, it'll be on the website, the key phrase in this, uh, sent in this paragraph is about four or five lines down where it says, while learning alongside them. The principal leads uh, teachers in a process while learning alongside them. And so that's, uh, that's one way of putting it. I'm gonna put it another similar way in a moment. And then I went to the research. In the research, uh, one of the best pieces by, was by Vivian Robinson of uh, Auckland. New Zealand, and she, had, she did a book called Student-Centered Leadership, in which she looked at uh, all the evidence she could find about the role of the principal in terms of his or her impact on student learning. And she said, this evidence, uh, if I calculate the effect sizes, comes down to five things, and that uh, she uses the same rule of thumb that John Hattie does, an effect size at .40 or so is worth looking at, still not very impressive, one that's uh, if it's above that, it's worth looking at even more closely. So this is what she found, and I'll, I'm gonna say it this way. All five of these are essential uh, to do, but only one stands out as very powerful, which is the one that I based the book on. So establishes goals and expectations, 0.42. Uh, you know, it's worth looking at, important to do, but not going to save the day. Resourcing strategically, that is um, time, other kinds of resources to do the work. Again, not very impressive, but useful. Number three, ensures quality teaching. This is uh, an interesting one because in our book on, social, on, uh, on uh, the professional capital of teachers, we have human, social, and decisional capital. Human capital is this. It's the quality of the individual teacher. And if you try to improve your school by only focusing on human capital and not on social capital, which is the culture, you won't get very far. You'll get a few people here, they'll come and they go. The stickiness comes from social capital, the group working together. And then, um, and so we said that's, that's important. And uh, what Vivian found was that, it, yeah, it's a, an important variable, but it does not carry the day. The one that does is this one, leading teacher uh, learning and development. We put it this way, it's the degree to which the principal 
and here's the key phrase, participates as a learner with teachers in moving the school forward. If the principal participates as a learner and does that for five years, guess what? They learn a lot. And five years later, they're great. If they don't participate as a learner, but they do the other four things, let's say, sorry, I didn't put, put the number up there. If they do the other four, thi four things up there, what, the, what happens is they do that for five years, then five years later, they know just about as much as they did in year one. Five times nothing is nothing. So they become, uh, so the leading teacher in learning is the, the key part of this. And then when we, uh, Vivian, who did the book on it, uh, we started to look at some of these uh, possibilities. It turned out that an actual, our work on social capital with decisional capital reinforced this, that uh, another uh, great reinforcement I read in, uh, from one of my colleagues that did a book on leadership, was not in education, but it was on leading for change. And she, he said and found that the, uh, one of the key characteristics for effective leaders was they were able to be experts and apprentices together at the same time. Experts on some things, they knew things that other people didn't know, and apprentices, which means they're learning from others. They need, they're able to do both of those. So you get this uh, important part. So in the, I, I didn't do this as much in the book, uh, because, uh, but we did, we did zero in on number four and kind of nailed it, I'm going to say, about the teacher uh, participating as a learner. Uh, since then, if you, many of you will know John Hattie's work on visible learning. Uh, he has his list of uh, effective teaching practices. And they go from uh, negative Im impact size to 1.40, let's say. And what, when we met with him five years ago, and we work with him continuously now, we said all of your findings are about individual practices of teachers. And we happen to know that collective practice is very powerful if you get it right, the combination right. And I said, what do you know about that? And he said, we haven't looked at the research, but I'll start doing that. So he did that, and now he's written in his new work, he says, the new winner is collective efficacy. The new winner is collective efficacy. It means it's got the highest effect size, as you would expect. If individual practices have good quality, and then you combine them where the group gets good at it, it's going to have a powerful additional interactive impact. So this was uh, reassuring. And then since, uh, because we've been pushing the overall capacity of the system, uh, the new conclusion, I haven't written as much about it, uh, have at least, but not in the kind of book sense, is this, that the really effective systems that have sustainability have school principles and other approach to leadership which develops the leadership of teachers. That's the key thing. It's implicit in that statement, leading learning, because uh, teachers affect learning indirectly through d the development. But, uh, but the, the part, and one of the ways I tested this is we started to notice it when we looked at and interacted and did some case studies on effective school districts like Whittier, for example, uh, uh, Whittier High School District, uh, on uh, the earlier ones on Long Beach uh, and others. Uh, Garden Grove is that they started with pretty strong leadership from the administrators and they gradually yielded to increasingly more teachers in leadership position. Still interacting with them, but now instead of chairing the meetings, they took a regular seat in the meetings. And uh, I, I'd asked a couple of people, uh, Sandy Thorstenson, who was the, uh, Prince, uh, the superintendent of Whittier, and another, a school I knew in Garden Grove where it was successful, I said to the, in the one case, the superintendent, in the other case to the su uh, principal, I said, calculate to me the number of your teachers that are in leadership positions, formal or informal, and send me the percentage of teachers that are in that. And they did that, and it was around 65 to 72%. We're in leadership positions. Now the principals and the other administrators were participating in the meetings, facilitating things, but they weren't chairing and running them. And if I look at some of the newest research on uh, the principalship, and I think of the Wallace Foundation has funded a lot of really good work, but what it looks to me as is that, uh, you can read their latest report, the pipeline of principalship, which is how they have six districts they're funding, how these six districts are producing a pipeline of future principals. To me, they are strengthening the instructional leadership role of the principal 
It's still about teacher leadership, but it's mainly about the principal leadership. And what they're not doing is strengthening the culture as much uh, independent of themselves, let's say. And when we think of, uh, I think I mentioned this this morning, when we think of effective leaders, we say they are people who work for five or six years in a uh, given uh, school or school system, and they develop collaboration and leadership among others for six years in a row to the point where they themselves become dispensable, more dispensable, because they've developed. And when I interviewed Michelle Pinchot, who was a principal at K3 Peters in Garden Grove, uh, she said literally, she said, I came here, uh, literacy was very low. Uh, this was a school with a lot of uh, kids, K-3, K uh, and literacy was stagnant. I gave myself five years, and the first year I went slow to move fast. Uh, later, I established relationships, trust, I began to, that if I had left in the first three years, it would have fallen apart. But now, she said, and I was in year five when I was interviewing her, she said, now if I left tomorrow, the school would carry on without me pretty well because they've got the collaborative culture established. It doesn't depend as much on me. And she did leave the next year, and it is carrying on. So this, uh, what I, and this is very conducive to the, uh, uh, um, the uh, labor management initiative, the LMI, is that the spread of the role of teacher leaders as people who help collaborative professionalism is very much part of this conclusion. Uh, I wanted to also pick up something I didn't talk about this morning, which was accountability that fourth part of it. And I think we have a formulation on accountability that uh, solves the problem, I'm going to say it boldly. Uh, the, uh, you recall that uh, accountability was seen as a negative um, driver because it was punitive, it was in your face, it was too, too much impositional. Uh, so you can't take uh, wrong accountability and say, you can say it's wrong, but you then can't say, therefore, we should have no accountability. The question has to be, what is good accountability? And uh, this is what uh, actually Richard Elmore uh, said at best 12 years ago. He said, no amount of external accountability will be effective in the absence of internal accountability. Internal accountability is self and collective responsibility. It's transparency. It's about building up your accountability. So we've turned accountability on its head and said the power base of accountability is internal. It is about... Uh, about efficacy and it's about transparency and it's about specificity and it's about building up your professional and political power to engage progress and to deal with the outside in relation to that. So you may want to question a little bit about it but the chapter in the book is pretty strong on this. So whole, one whole domain then is to really try to uh, head off, I'm going to say, the tendency for the system because it's run more hierarchically to strengthen the formal leadership positions as the solution. What is the solution is that the formal leaders are in the business of strengthening the informal leadership of the system, including some formal teacher leaders. That's where the depth comes. That's where sustainability comes. The second thing I wanted to say uh, is about this. Uh, we are working increasingly on leadership from the middle, saying the top-down change doesn't work. Bottom-up change doesn't work if you leave it to the individual schools. Would, uh, where's the glue? The glue is in the middle. Uh, sometimes we take the whole state system, the glue can be the districts or even the counties. If we take a given district, the middle art school principles. You want to strengthen the, the, the middle uh, and, and, the, and then more, this is stated abstractly, but it's coming from our work at trying to figure out system change. And when we surround this with some of the insights, uh, there are these. The top messages invest, interacts, and intervenes. The middle gets stronger, the bottom liberates. The principle at the top here, exploit upward and liberate downward. Sounds like a lot of jargon, but it's actually meaningful in an operational sense. Uh, we say it, if you're, uh, uh, you know, whatever the level you're at, your job should be to interact upward, but not do what you're told, uh, literally. That one of the interesting features about leadership is that one of the most damning things that you can say about a leader, I'm going to say, is that he or she was nice and compliant with what the policy was supposed to be. Therefore, there's no room for, uh, for the innovation. I don't mean they should be deliberately rebellious, but they should be purposefully non-compliant for the moral imperative agenda, for developing it independent of it. Uh, so, uh, and we, we have the also that uh, 
observation. I've adapted it uh, accurately, I think, uh, away from Ronald Reagan, who said uh, when he was dealing with Gorbachev, I have to trust and verify, because I don't really trust, but therefore, I, whatever we come up with, I have to make sure I follow up and, make, and see it happening. Uh, the one, the our insight in this, a different language and powerfully different, is that as a leader, you have to trust and interact. Trust and verify is to look over somebody's shoulder. Trust and interact is to really trust and learn from them and be influential. It's a whole different ball game to trust and interact. And that's what leaders are doing. They circulate, they are part of it as they develop other, uh, other leaderships in that. So I want to uh, say one more thing and then I'm just gonna do a quick over to you to see what issues there are. In our old and new, uh, in our new pedagogies, we called the project New Pedagogies for Deep Learning. And then some people started to say to us, well, who do you think you are? Uh, you don't have all the new ped pedagogies in the world. There are a lot of good pedagogies that have been around before you. And we said, yeah, that's true, but let's look more uh, fine-grained at it. So I did this uh, four-fold table where I said, yeah, uh, pedagogies, there are old good pedagogies and old bad pedagogies. And there are good new pedagogies and bad new pedagogies. So we want good, good, and we want to jettison bad, bad. And so that's how I came up with this, and I said, let's look at what they are. Good old pedagogies are treasure tests. These are you know, constructivism, collaborative inquiry, a lot of things that have been around. Uh, John Dewey and many others who, uh, Jerome Bruner, uh, some of the, the knowledge development people. So they should be valued and brought forward. But they're also bad old pedagogies. What's a bad old pedagogy? Teacher talk without student participation. I call that the junk heap. Let's get rid of them. And then coming along with technology are what we would admittedly call uh, bad new pedagogies, right? They're new, but they're bad, like uh, using technology superficially. So I call that the shiny object problem. You fall for it. And it's not much there, there, but it, it can be engaging. And that the newer stuff that we're actually doing is around partnerships with, uh, between and among students, teachers, and families. Learning partnerships that empower all three of those, and they do them in direction. So we're doing one and four to try to break through what I described uh, earlier. Uh, so I wanted to just uh, go back to this uh, deep learning, because I think it is the structure now of deep learning, uh, I think that is the solution. And we are very much worried, not as worried as Richard Elmore, but we probably should be, that the existing system is not capable of transforming into deep learning. It's too steeped in too many wrong things for that to happen. And uh, this is what, in one way, what Jal Mehta, uh, who's a sociologist at Harvard, uh, did. He got a grant from the Hewlett Foundation to go and study or ex uh, examine schools that were, nom secondary schools that were nominated as deep learning schools. So they went out, his team, and they went across the country. And he wrote a report that basically said, we were so excited to go out there because these were handpicked as uh, schools that uh, were, had deep learning, and we found virtually nothing, and we are so depressed. That nothing that was, in other words, it was superficial, it wasn't their depth. So he said, uh, I'm gonna write a blog, which he did, and this, you can go to his, uh, Meta is M-E-H-T-A, and get this blog. He said, here are 10 ways to die with deep learning. If you haven't experienced it yourself, you're not gonna be able to do it. If you're unwilling to reimagine the grammar of schooling, this is uh, you know, how classes are organized, uh, the learning environment, timetables, a whole bunch of things about how school is thought of. If you don't respect your students in the present as opposed to the future, I love this one. This is your, st uh, if you start thinking, I'm preparing students for the future, you're dead in the water, because the future is right now. Uh, you, can't, you can't make the future relevant and the present less relevant. Everything's relevant, because it's in real time now. If you don't give students some choice, pretty obvious one. If you don't live by less is more, don't try to cover the curriculum, otherwise it'll be superficial. Uh, you, and incidentally, well, we'll get to the positive stuff here. And then five more. If you aren't willing to admit you don't know the answer, this comes up time and again. The learners always are ready to say, I don't know the answer to this. But when they say it, they get the answer, and five years later, they know a lot of answers. They just get more knowledgeable. But if they, do, if they play it safe, which we call the imposter syndrome, 
and they pretend they know what they don't know. Everybody knows actually that they don't want to know what they don't know, but, but they, you try to gloss it over so you're a double loser that way. Uh, if you don't normalize failure, another one where it says, it's normal to fail in order to succeed. succeed. It's normal, normal. How did anybody get better at any, at any performance if they didn't fail? If you don't help students feel like they belong in your class or your domain, this is a powerful one about relationships. Remember the, uh, the hidden figures diagram I showed that said it's relationships plus pedagogy? This is about relationships. If teachers think about my classroom is my domain, and here are some students that really don't fit in my domain, they are finished as being able to reach those students. Your domain is the world, not your private enclave. If you aren't willing to see the world, set the world a little askew, if you don't realize that creating deep learning is a countercultural enterprise, this is Elmore's point, it's so countercultural that it's gonna be very hard to change this. So we in our uh, work on deep learning, where we have about 1,200 schools, they're in clusters of 30, 10, 15, they're always multiples because we want them to work together. We were having different experiences, at least with these, and this is derivatives of our experience. Uh, you, you can get to deep learning if you go from simple to complex ideas. Uh, th these interact incidentally. Some, uh, a lot of the ideas are, have to do with real life problems, locally or beyond. Uh, learning that is simultaneously personal and collective. It's deep if, you're, if it's personally meaningful to you and you're part of a team or a group where it's meaningful for that collectivity. It's more powerful that way. Learning that changes relationships and pedagogy, not one or the other. If you uh, know Paul Tuff's book, the second book, How Children Helping Children Succeed. Helping Children Succeed, he has the last uh, chapter, about 30 pages, example after example, named of places where they changed the relationship and the pedagogy and got the results, especially for students that were, de were not doing well. Learning that sticks, this is uh, perhaps redundant, except what, what sticks when something's passionate? When, you get, when, you're, when the team is committed to it, when you get better at it, when you start to get results and you want more, those things stick and they stick for your life. Critical mass of others, so not just a lone thing, uh, but others, teams and beyond that, we see schools working on these. And then the last uh, few, learning built on innovation relative to key problems and issues. This is continuous improvement, but it's also innovation. How do we solve these particular problems? Uh, there's a big project we have in Toronto called Maximum City, where teams of, uh, st of students working with their teachers are selecting projects that would improve the city of Toronto. And there's, there's flooding the city. Uh, there's seven classes going on uh, in July doing this all over, and they're learning, and they're being part of the urban, urban set of issues about the future of uh, Toronto in this case. Learning that attacks inequity to get excellence for all, I hope Pedro will talk about this. Uh, we have uh, done a paper that we haven't finalized yet. It's called uh, uh, System uh, Change, Whole System Change, uh, Deep Learning and the Equity Hypothesis. And the equity hypothesis, which we have proof to, is that when you give students who are disconnected from schooling a chance to work hands-on with something that's meaningful for them and with them, and you build on that, is that they become more and more committed, they learn a lot more, and that the whole deep learning makers move and hands-on favors that kind of development for those students. And so we have, we've been collecting vignettes, one-page vignettes of uh, real students with hypothetical, with, uh, uh, with, you know, with uh, not with their real names, but students that, hey, here's a student, and here's one page, and they went from being totally disconnected to being flourishing. These are actual cases, and they're, they're kind of multiplying. And it shows, and Pedro and I have talked about, uh, could, would it be possible to take a group of 20 schools, which were very de where, you know, serious problems, and turn around the, the effect of what he calls intergenerational poverty? persistent intergenerational poverty. Could you turn around the negative effects of that to get a positive outcome? That's a big hypothesis, but that's where this is heading. 
learning that engages the world to change the world. This is a phrase that we did not have at the beginning that came out of the work, that uh, students could have uttered it. They did utter it. They want to engage the world to change the world. And if they're, if they're in, you know, really alienated, there's certain kind of basic things that have to develop first. But uh, one could say humans are social species, and this is what their propensity is, unless, this, unless their life interferes with that propensity and, and blunts it. Number nine, learning that creates citizens of tomorrow, uh, today. Students are saying, we don't want to be prepared to be a citizen 10 years from now. We want to be, we're citizens, to, we want to be citizens today, not five years from now or even three years from now. The world needs me, the world needs us. Got to be a citizen now. So the immediacy of it is great. It's a great motivator. And finally, in this one, I haven't actually examined the research. I'm sure it's true. Learning where younger people make older people better. We are seeing it so much. Students are making their teachers better by influencing pedagogy. There's an openness to it. There's an enabling of it. And, uh, and it's, uh, let me see if I have a 30 second clip on just a, a snippet of this. It's not so much fully this, but it's a really good example of the student as a change agent. So this is one of our uh, schools in Toronto, and it's, uh, it's got 70% Bangladesh students. And the principal and the staff, uh, over a three-year period, created this much more learning environment of students who were really uh, didn't speak English when they came. Parents certainly didn't. A lot of poverty. <clears throat> and the principal came into his office one day, and uh, he can, uh, I'd like you to hear from him. The principal's name is Greg McLeod. Uh, he comes in, and this is what he finds on his desk. The grade one class is the one that's currently working on changing their learning environment. And when I walked in one morning, on my keyboard was a uh, iPad with a little sticky note that said, play me. And it was my grade one kids talking about why they needed to change their learning environment because it will make it a better learning space for them. And I thought, if grade ones can articulate why they need to change their environment to create a more collaborative working space, you have to kind of give them what they want. So these are six and seven year olds using that language. We want to hear our ideas to change the learning environment for their language so we can be more collaborative and more effective. So in, um, we're just finishing this book on deep learning, which uh, spells this out uh, with examples. <clears throat> but we see students as agents of change pedagogically, as you saw implied by Greg. Organizationally, what's the learning environment like? How do we change it? How do we part of that? And societally, which is societally can be local issues or they can be global issues, but they become part of the whole uh, curriculum in that way. So uh, what do I want to say? Um, just in closing, as we are uh, uh, just finishing up a report for the Stewart Foundation on what's happened in the middle in the last three years in California. And uh, I alluded to it earlier this morning uh, in a sense, which was good things have happened in the sense there's been a massive shift over to the right drivers, capacity building, teamwork, uh, pedagogy, uh, systemness. So that's the good news. And then the worrying news is the capacity to take advantage of the new possibilities is very uneven. And if I use the words, uh, the w I would use the word cultural legacy to say cultural legacy is when you want to change from something to something else. And so the desire there is to change it. But as you change it, you slip back in the old ways so that you slip back in the old ways in a, in, a, in a way that even you aren't necessarily in favor of, but it, it's, it's your way of doing things. It's your fail-safe way of doing things. So I think the shift in capacity here, and we notice it in two ways, and we'll spell it out with a lot more detail. <clears throat> One is that the uh, old bureaucracy of uh, where the state says, we are moving away from compliance towards capacity. Number one, they say that. Number two, they say LCAP is a great opportunity for local uh, control now. Uh, and also number two, submit your LCAP plans. Here's the template. 
and then the plans are submitted to the county offices, and then the bureaucracy takes over, and a 30-page plan becomes a 300-page plan in almost every case, because the people who are approving the plans know what they know, which are which they're technicians, basically, in the, by and large, and they're doing what they are good at. So I, I actually don't see that problem as fatal. I think it's annoying if you're having to face it. But it's not fatal because the system isn't condoning it, it's just part of the package. Which, which is more problematic is what I showed this morning as the false uh, signals, is that you are moving towards capacity building, away from compliance. But the skill to do that at the local level is not highly developed, so you don't really know how to do it. And that the support systems in the, in the overall system uh, are not up to being able to solve that problem. And, and uh, in some ways, this is the, uh, the big issue right now for you, for California, for us, because we feel like we're part of the family, is what's going to happen in the next 24 months for this trend, which is the right trend, to move from being <clears throat> by and large kind of appearing, but not appearing deeply, to becoming more examples of the deep appearance of it so that the system then gets stronger, gets more effective, and becomes to uh, that. And, and another reason we're interested in it is that the state of California, to us, is the only state, qua state, that's really on the track of creating a system that is more like what we're talking about. And no other system is really doing that. Uh, maybe a little bit small states could try it, but nobody worth look, or nobody noteworthy is doing it. So a lot depends on California. I, I, don't, I think pe people who th say California is positioned to save the US, I mean, that's a good thing to do, but you want to do it anyways, even if the rest part doesn't get saved. You want to save yourselves. And, uh, and that's, that's motivation, I know. And, and it's right to actually make this system so good that it has sustainability, and that's the, really what we're facing. And that's why we look forward to continuing to work with you all in that. And this initiative is one of the pieces definitely on the right track. So let's close there, and we'll see you in the breaks and this evening as well. Thanks very much.